Thank you. And actually, on behalf of the speakers, I encourage the students uh, to come speak with us, ask questions, and so on. OK, so, so first of all, kind of a change of plan is clearly I'm going slower than, than I prepare my lectures for. So today and tomorrow, I'll finish the basics of GIT, and I will do some sketch of um, construction for uh, for uh, for the modula uh, for the moduli space of curves, and since all this stuff uh, is more or less contained in standard sources, I want to take the fifth lecture to to do something that's not there. So to do something more more current research, and uh, so it might be it might be a different style of lecture from what we did so far. But I mean, the idea is to inspire you and stuff like that. So anyway, and, uh, and second of all, again, a small change of plans. Uh, the, there were a lot of questions in Cernesi's uh, lecture, the previous lecture about uh, whatever. So basically, the lecture is, so the mantra, so the modern moduli is, Don't worry about finite groups, quotients by finite groups, which lead to finite, to quotient singularities. And don't worry about fine. Don't worry about fine versus coarse moduli space. If you are the young, <laughs> fine moduli spaces always exist. <laughs> you just call them stacks. And <laughs> so, uh, so, 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 so there, there are some technical things, uh, but basically, and next lecture, I'm sure that uh, that you'll have an intensive lecture where, whatever, the quotient singularities are like smooth. So this would be like uh, the birational geometry lectures from uh, from next week. So really, don't worry about quotient singularities. But because because so the simplest GIT. And this is kind of off script, so, so hopefully it will work out. So the simplest GIT, of course, is x mod g, like a finite group action. So, and for instance, the classical examples are the following, are the AD singularities, which are C2 modulo g, which is g is finite subgroup of SL2c. So in particular, so the an singularities are the simplest. So an, also known as 1n, 1 minus 1 singularities. These are those corresponding to the subgroup G, the cyclic subgroup generated by zeta, zeta to n minus 1, or zeta inverse, where zeta is a root of order n of unity. And, uh, and let me show you, so we know that an AN singularity, <coughs> AN singularity, <coughs> is the same thing as given by the vanishing locus of, um, let's see if I get it right, x squared plus y squared plus z to the n plus 1 inside C3. So this is a germ of a singularity inside the free fold thing. And what does it have to do with GIT? 
And let's take the case A1. So this is simply C squared acted by the cyclic group of order two, where the action is simply, okay, how should I call this one? <coughs> this is whatever, <laughs> this is a trivial element and the generator zeta. So zeta acts on x, y by minus x minus y. Of course, zeta, you can think of it of as minus one, but I just want to inf emphasize the, the action. <coughs> okay, so what did we learn from GIT? So this is nothing but the spectrum of the ring of invariance, so RG. Uh, A1, <coughs> this would be two. Uh, yeah, you are right. So it's n plus one. And uh, A1, it would be mu. Okay, so this is isomorphic with mu n plus one. And this is order n plus one. Okay, so what did we learn so far is that if I want to do this quotient, is the spectrum of the ring of invariance. So what is the ring of invariance? So I have x, y here. I'm taking the, the invariance with respect to this involution. I can call it x, y goes to that tau. And it's clear what is this one. So what are the obvious invariants? x square, x, y, and z square. Because of course, x square, I'm y square. And of course, I can call them uh, U, V, and W. So this would be isomorphic with C, U, V, W, modulo. I have a relation V square minus U, W, which gives you exactly the same equation. So this gives you the equation for A1 u square minus uw, which is equivalent to u square plus v square plus w square. So what I'm saying here is that the simplest example of GIT is, of course, quotients by finite groups. But in some sense, so this would be actually a fine quotient. So, 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 so this would be a geometric quotient et cetera, et cetera. So from the perspective of GIT, this would not be an interesting example. <coughs> but of course, it fits the same pattern. We compute invariants and so on and so forth. OK. So what I'm saying is that whatever, we'll abuse this thing over and over, is that basically when you have finite stabilizers, which you see that Finite stabilizers, and I'll come back next time. When you have a finite stabilizer, basically you have this type of singularities, or more general, not only ADE, but this type of singularities. But these are so mild that you can pretend that they're smooth. So basically, when you have a geometric quotient, you, you kind of lie a bit, and you say that's a smooth, smooth thing and a nice. OK. So today, the, the subject of my lecture is uh, VGIT. So let me get there. So variation of GIT. So last time, we constructed, so we have G acting on X in the projective space. This is projective, this is reductive, and we constructed x mod g as the quotient x s mod g. So here I'm using this kind of, like, this is GIT quotient. This is kind of still GIT quotient, but nothing special, kind of. So here is special because you throw away the semi-stable, uh, the unstable point. So we define this one by gluing affine quotients. 
Now I want to take a different perspective, so take a different, take a different view. So how can I how can I get from projective to affine? Because the affine case I understand very well. So this is like projective situation. But instead of viewing this one, I'm viewing it as the cone. This is the affine cone over this one in a n plus one. Remember that I don't know if you read harsh or not anything, projective is the same thing as graded rings. I mean, you have to, to be careful and put some certain kind of things. But basically, you can transform the projective situation in an affine situation. So this would be given by spectrum of a certain ring. So why not the quotient to be spec of Rg. So this should be x mod g equals that. Oh well, it is clear that this, this kind of forgets the grading. So basically we get more than we bargain for. So we have to replace by proj of Rg. So in order to take take care also of the fact that we pass to the cone and then forget the cone structure and so So, so basically we have the definition. X is X mod G in the projective case is proj of R G. So now let's take a closer uh, closer look. So what is this R and the grading and so forth? This is nothing else but the ring of sections Rxl. So remember that I have x embedded into the projective space Pn, uh, which is given by a linear system by a line bundle. So this is the ring of sections. So this is just, this occurred, I think, in in previous talks, in Olivier's talk. And then I'm taking the invariance. So this is the new definition. So maybe homework problem is first of all C equivalence to previous. This means basically localize at f invariant polynomial. And second of all, C, Y, we need to ignore the unstable points. So remember, last time the unstable points came up because we wanted to cover it by affines, invariants, and now you'll see that the, uh, the unstable points again, or the semi-stable points come up, come up again when you take this proj definition. Okay, now with this proj definition, we see clearly GIT depends on L and actually on a linearization of L. So what is a linearization? And let's make it simple here. So if I have L over X, a G action here, a G linearization on L, is a lift of the G action to L, to the, I don't know, maybe strictly speaking, to the total space of L. So I have a line bundle over a projective variety. On the projective variety, I have a group action. What I want to do is to lift the action upstairs 
if I have a linearization, so basically linearization is the same thing as uh, linear action on, uh, on the projective space in which x lives. Actually not. So it's actually a linear action on the con situation, on the affine space. So the linearization means that I'm acting on the affine space where I'm embedding my variety. I'm extending the action from the variety to the, to the affine space. And of, course, and of course, you see that it's kind of clear and obviously Mumford knew this one that, uh, that uh, this depends on the choice, the choice of line bundle and actually also the linearization. So because simply the ring of sections changes and of course uh, whatever the ring of invariance potentially changes. But unfortunately this was ignored for, uh, I don't know, for, so from 60s up to 90s, so more than 30 years it was ignored. So basically the dependence on L ignored up to the work of, I mean, there are some ins instances where it was not ignored. So Tadeus and Dolgachev, Gachev, who, which was in the early 90s. I think 92 and 94, the papers appeared. So the mantra is that the dependence on L is unexpectedly nice. And more than this one, okay, this is a fact of life, so there is something nice in mathematics, but kind of, I mean, typically you would expect exactly the opposite. Speaking of moduli and stuff like that, remembers Murphy's law, Vakil's Murphy's law. So typically things go, go as bad as this is a rare instance where, where, where the situation is actually nice, and this is what I would, but more, more, more kind of important, it has tremendous applications, so huge applications. And I hope to, to get to that. Uh, because I, I, I hidden there, because I hidden there in the lifting. So, so first of all, it depends on the embedding in the projective space. Because remember my definition of semi-stable points and so on. You see, I mean the ring of section. This is giving me. So, the ring of section gives me the embedding in the projective, uh, projective space. So this is given by L. Of course, if I take an embedding somewhere else, remember the semi-stable were defined as thing that exists F, which is a section of uh, O, some power of N, G invariant, such that F of X different from zero. Of course, if I go to a different embedding, I will have other polynomials, other invariants. So you see that it depends. And also the more subtle, and okay, so let's discuss, discuss this. And so, so let me discuss, uh, so the main VGAT results. So let's write it again here. So X, and maybe if I want to emphasize is L there, this is my definition. This is proj Rx, L. Okay, so this is the definition. Uh, G. Yeah. Okay, so let's see what we have to do. So first of all, let's discuss about, actually even before that, let's make some basic, basic remarks. So first of all, I'll have the notation peak, peak x, g, these are g linearized 
line bundles. So this is the pair of line bundle plus choice of lift to G. Obviously, I have a map from peak XG to peak X. Now, in general, in full generality, this is neither injective nor surjective. But uh, before that, let's make some, some basic remarks. So first of all, I would remark that X mod LG is the same thing as X L to power NG. So basically, I can replace L by L to power N. So uh, why, uh, why is that? Because we know how the proj works. Should I write it or everyone knows it? So let me write it. So if I have S a graded ring, so this is <coughs> direct sum of Sn. If I take proj of uh, Sn, this is actually isomorphic with proj of the same thing where I multiply everything by k. So this is the sum n, n. So proj is kind of, I can re replace uh, like Sn by, for instance, even, I'm only looking at even degrees. Nothing changes. Actually, something changes. Do you know what's changing? So what, what do I have on, on the proj construction? These things come canonically equipped with a line bundle O of 1. So this one, it will just do the same thing. I'll have the same space, but I'm doing a very nice embedding, so I'm changing by O of N. But in terms of the quotients, nothing changes. Actually, more is true. So, so this tells me that I should look at peak X, G, with two coefficients. I don't care about z coefficients because I can always, I can always multiply it out. So this is the right space. Furthermore, is not hard, but I mean beyond the point of these lectures. It so x l g depends only on numerical equivalence. So I should look instead of n, s, g, q as the parameter space for, uh, for uh, uh, g linearized line bundle. I mean, I can look at peak, but basically everything is captured in the neuron severity group. And this is important because as uh, Olivier said, this is like a finite dimensional vector space. Actually, let's see. How do I know it's a finite dimensional vector space? And let's put a theorem here. At least the statement of the theorem. So theorem. So I have N, S, X, G with Q coefficients. If I'm taking with Q coefficients, it turns out that this is surjective. So, so surjection with Q coefficients. So this is finite dimensional vector space, which is, of course, nice. I mean, the Picard is much more kind of complicated. And second of all, let's see what is the kernel here. And let's think loudly. So let's remember what is a linearization. I have a lifting of G. And this thing here tells me that I can lift 
to G here. But what are the choices to lift? So I can lift. What are the choices? Here it helps to, it helps to think about think about the case given that I have lift and I killed all the global obstructions and stuff like that you can think that x is just a point then what is the line bundle after the over the point how, how did you I mean I didn't prove it that's a, that, that's <laughs> part of <laughs> that's part of the statement so the statement is that any line bundle some multiple of it will, will have a G linearization. This is the statement and G is reductive. So I have surjection there. And now I, I'm asking, so given that I have at least one lift, how many lifts do I get? And I, so here, I mean, if you think I have, I can trivialize the part of having a lift has to do with something global, like the projectivity, uh, I mean, gluing of affines and so on. But now that I have a lift, I don't care about that anymore. I can even think about kind of the most stupid situation. I have a point and the line bundle over the point. What is that? A line bundle over a point. I mean, the total space of a line bundle over a point. This is just C. So what are the choices of the linearization? These are just character of C. So this is the characters of G, which means simply uh, chi goes from G to C star, basically one dimensional representation uh, characters of G. So now note that, and of course I have Q coefficients. So note if G is semi-simple, <coughs> as in the case of SLN, then uh, the character group is just trivial. If G is a torus, so this is basically C star to some power, then the character of the torus is a lattice, is isomorphic. This is a, we'll see to the R. So we understand very well kind of the situation. So in particular, you see, so maybe let me put it corollary for uh, G equals PGLN or SLN, then the NSXQ, uh, GQ is isomorphic with NSQ. So basically, if you work uh, work uh, in the standard situation of moduli you mod out by PGLN, there is no difference between linearizations and line, ample line bundles. So the second definition is that I'm saying that L is a G effective line bundle if uh, if L is ample, maybe here semi-ample would work. Okay, let's not. L is ample and uh, there exist at least one G invariant section, which is non-constant. So this is to say that X mod LG is different from empty. So now, and we'll, we'll see in a moment. So it can happen that L is ample, G linearized, but we'll have a moment, but there is no invariant section. Because remember, in, my, in the first day I was saying that there, there exist always semi-stable points. It turns out that this is not true. Anyway, we denote CG of X inside the neuron severity X GQ, the cone of G linearized 
line bundles. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so this is equivalent because uh, yeah, because if you have only constant and you take the approach, uh, the approach is an kind of empty. Anyway, okay. So the second theorem, kind of theorem one of the VGIT, is that C G of X. So I have the projection from Neron Severi of X. G to Neron Severi X and always with Q coefficients, always Q coefficients. Yeah. Cone of G effective, effective. So to to skip the writing Q over and over when I write Neron Severi is with Q coefficients. So I have the natural surjection and the Neron Severi, I think it was discussed or it will be discussed, I have the ample cone of X. This is, this is the ample cone of X. Then the statement is that this one is pi inverse of the ample cone intersected with R, where R is a rational polyhedral cone in Neron Severi. So, I mean, we have examples, kind of whatever, rational surfaces with kind of round cones. So, the ample cone can be round. But the, but the G linearized one. And of course, it's kind of a cone. So there might be some roundness, but that is coming only from the boundary of the ample cone. All, all that has to do with GIT is perfectly, perfectly round. Yeah. Uh, you can work, and uh, that's another day. So, so, so you can. So, so the definition, the definition, all the definitions that I did were by embedding X into the projective space. Once I do that, I need ampleness, and this is a key assumption. I mean, we have a paper, and I don't know. So that's anyway. Let me come to that. So, so actually, where do you use ampleness the the heaviest? So ampleness is used in the following statement. If I have F uh, a section of some power of L, maybe G invariant or not, then S F is affine. That's where I use, uh, where, where I use uh, the ampleness. Maybe very ample or something. A anyway, where the ampleness, the positivity shows up. Okay, so let's go to, did I erase my cone? Hopefully not. Okay. So theorem kind of one prime. Okay, I need the definition first. So definition. We say that L and L prime in CG of X are GIT equivalent. If uh, X semi stable of L is identified with X semi stable of L prime. 
So this implies that x table is equal to x table and that the quotients are isomorphic as spaces. So I define a, a linear, uh, 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 an equivalence relation. So this is an equivalence relation which defines cells. Cells which are uh, whatever the equivalence classes in CG of X. Now, of course, kind of these cells and everything else can be as bad as possible, but this is the theorem one plus if you want. Okay, so there exists a finite number of cells, all of them rational polyhedral inside CG of X. Closure of a cell is a union of smaller dimension cells. And then I define, so this is the statement of the theorem. Hopefully I didn't forget something. Anyway, so chamber would be the maximal dimensional cell. And wall would be the, I don't know, <laughs> maybe, I don't know, it's clear what is a wall, so it's separating two chambers. So the statement is that, okay. So I have this CG of X, and then I have a finite decomposition into chambers. So inside the chamber, the quotient stays constant. No, 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 it's finite. So globally finite. That's the, that's the statement. So the decomposition is finite, finite. OK, now. Yeah, they, they, can, they can still be at the boundary, and I think I'm saying something about the interior. I don't think I'm saying anything about the boundary. Maybe bad stuff can, can happen at the boundary. I don't know exactly. Anyway, but OK, so you have this kind of picture. And this actually leads, maybe there will be some discussion. <laughs> this is like Mori dream space. So actually, this kind of this is an I mean one of the I don't know the best papers in algebraic geometry is uh, Kiel and Hu, okay, so Hu and Kiel I guess, Hu and Kiel, where he where they discuss the connection between Mori dream space, which is a concept in birational geometry, and actually variation of JD. Uh, there is, uh, so, so there is something written, if you, if you want to get a quick taste uh, in my survey, so you can go there and then go to the original paper. Now the second set of results and the second things that we want to, to, to understand. Which one? Are the chambers convex? 
Yeah, so everything is as nice, uh, so I think I missed something, but whatever, everything is as nice as possible. That's kind of the surprising thing that's, and actually, why is that? Why is that? Because GIT reduces to toric geometry, to toric situation. And I kind of doubt that I'll have, I'll, have, I'll have time. So everything kind of reduces to some sort of torus situation. And so the question is basically, I have chamber one, chamber two. What's happening if I move from one chamber to the other? And let's fix the notation. So I, I assume for simplicity that I have this kind of simple situation. So here I have line bundle L0. Here I have the line bundle L plus and L minus. So this is a simple fact. Is that the semi-stable locus as I move from L plus or the same L minus is included in the semi-stable locus of L zero. So if I move from a line bundle, or in other words, if you want, if I move from a specific line bundle to nearby, I'll lose invariance. So this is kind of lose invariance. As I perturb L0. And uh, this actually implies also the opposite inclusion, the stable locus actually becomes bigger as I move from plus to minus. So this is opposite. So what does it imply? Just by general nonsense, it implies that I have the following picture. I have, yes. So the plus and minus is that I have L0 is a line bundle on the wall, and L plus and L minus are perturbations of that line bundle. And of course, if I write it in this way, I'm assuming something like L plus minus is L0 plus minus epsilon, another line bundle. I assume that they are kind of in the same, in a ray situation. Okay, so let's see what, what do I get. Because a semi-stable locus gets bigger, the GIT quotient becomes smaller, so what it means is that I have maps L plus, uh, okay, how did I denote it? L plus G into X. Uh, I'll do an example in a few minutes so you'll see what's happening. So I have some sort of contraction maps. And on the other hand, if I look at the excess mod, um, mod uh, uh, G, so this is a geometric quotient, and this is for L plus. I think I have exactly the opposite inclusion, so this is the opposite inclusion. Okay, so let's see. This is contraction, and this is inclusion that way. So this is that way. L zero G, this is included here. So basically the exceptional, whatever, the birational, assuming that these are non-empty, this is birational. And basically the birational, 
by rational modification occurs for points that cease to be semi-stable, uh, cease to be stable with respect to L plus because introducing new orbits at L0. So what's happening is that I'll have some stable things. You see that the stable locus is included there, but there will be st things that are stable here that actually will kind of be mapped there, and we'll see an, an example in a few minutes. And of course, I have the picture on the other direction. So I have x, l minus g. And the theorem of Hadeus Tolgachev, who is the following. So assume that, uh, I don't know, x table is non-empty for <coughs> L plus, L zero, L minus. And let's call these maps F plus and F minus. Then F plus and F minus are birational maps. And if both are small, meaning do not contract a divisor, then this here, here, G, is a flip with respect to O of 1, which is uh, whatever, O of 1, which is associated to the proj morphism, to the projective morphism. Uh, X L plus G goes to X L zero G. So anytime you have, uh, any, anytime you have a projective morphism, anytime you have a projective morphism, there is a relative O of one, and to define a flip, so let me put the definition of flip. Sorry. Uh, G is always a birational map uh, under my assumption, but but uh, but otherwise, okay. So this is the generic case. This is the generic case. If one of them is birational contraction, then the other is an isomorphism. Yeah, if it's the divisorial, yeah, divisorial contraction, sorry. So if generically they are both small and you have a flip. In the special situation where you have divisorial, you actually the other one is forced to be an isomorphism. Okay, so what is a flip? So definition flip. So I have the following situation, x, uh, uh, no, I have x plus goes to x, x, okay, I don't, I don't have that. So I have x, f plus, and I have d, so f plus is a small proper birational map, d is a, uh, Q Cartier divisor on X plus such that D is relatively negative with respect to F plus. 
So basically, D is giving me the contraction there. Then a flip, a D flip is is a diagram, so it's x minus f minus 2x, which is again small, such that if I take d prime, which is the push forward of uh, d, this is OK because co-dimension 2. I want this one to be q Cartier and relatively ample with respect to f minus. And I think if it exists, then the flip is unique. OK, maybe here, I'm, maybe one has to be a bit careful here, but anyway. So what's the idea? This is exactly, and you'll hear it over and over next week. So the idea is that you have a divisor, which is negative, you contract it. But if you get a small, small map, then that divisor fails to be Cartier. Is it remains only a vile divisor. So D here is only vile divisor, not Cartier. And then you want to continue the minimal model program. You need to blow up something to do a partial resolution. And that's the notion of flip. And kind of the statement here is that, uh, is that, uh, that, one, that one is actually a flip. And, uh, and so on. Actually, I have something more to say. Uh, I mean, a flip is too general. It's like saying a blow up or something. So in this generality, I don't know if it's really helpful. There is a theorem kind of 2 prime or 2 plus which is more, which is better, but if I start to state it, I will never get. So let me work an example. Okay, and this is, uh, okay, so we start with, with GIT for cubic curves. So I'm taking P8. This is just, uh, uh, okay, it's P9 maybe, P9. This is uh, C0, C9 coefficients of a cubic in P2. And then I'm considering M bar, which is just P9 mod SL3. This is GIT for plane cubics. And I'm getting, this is easy to see, this is exactly P1. So this is nothing else but uh, like the J line. And let me just do quickly a picture. You'll have the affine line. Here there will be the smooth cubics the smooth elliptic curves. This is the J invariant. And over infinity, you have the following picture. You have nodal, you have uh, this one and that one. This is the biggest orbit. This is the enclosure of that one. And this is just a point in that. So let me write it more carefully. A cubic is stable, is equivalent to smooth, is semi-stable, is equivalent to nodal, smooth or nodal, and the pole is stable, not stable, is a single point, is the orbit of that. So 
I might go five minutes uh, over time, but let me, let's make sure that you understand this example before going to VGAT. So I'm taking, I'm taking cubic polynomials in whatever, three variables. So cubic in P2. If I put the, the coefficients together, I'm getting P9. And then, of course, I want to do change of coordinates, so I mod out by SL3. Now this is nine dimensional. This is eight dimensional. And in this situation, I think I can even explicitly prove that this is actually P1. That's no surprise here. So I have P1. There will be an A1, which will be geometric quotient. This is basically X stable mod G. And this corresponds to smooth cubics. The things that are still semi-stable but not smooth are the nodal ones. For cubics, you have the irreducible nodal cubic, the conic plus a line, or three lines in that situation. Not three lines meeting in a point. Okay, and this is the minimal orbit. This is the closed minimal orbit. And this is what sits over infinity. Now I want to, and this is based, I mean, I did something. This is kind of a derived example from my thesis, so I did something. Anyway, let's do something fun. Let's consider moduli of cubics with a line. So I'm considering cubic plus a line. And let's call this moduli P pairs. This is kind of moduli of pairs. Now the parameter space is, what is the parameter space here? It is P8 times P2 dual. Uh, P9 times P2 dual. This is, this is, this is, let's call it X. So I'm interested in doing X mod SL3. But now not that whatever, the peak of X, which is the same thing as neuron severity of X, which is the same thing as neuron severity of X, uh, G linearized, is uh, Q square. I'm working with uh, Q coefficients. So I have two line bundles. I mean, my line bundles will be O, A, and B. So these are my line bundles here. In fact, it is clear that the GIT only depends on the slope which I do B over A. I normalize this one to be one. So basically, my GIT, I would have a one parameter variation of GIT. I mean, a priori is two, is two parameter. I have two dimensional thing, but because everything is a cone, I can projectivize and so on. So by the way, so let's see, and maybe I should do here a picture, and I will close, uh, I will continue with this example next time, but okay, so this is A and B. What is ample cone, first of all? This is ample cone. Hopefully I'm not, anyway, so this is the ample cone in this situation. It turns out, that the CG con C, CGX is actually determined here by zero and here by three halves. So this is slope three halves. So here I have ample but no section, no no G invariant section. And furthermore, this thing here will be divided slope th three fifths and one. So next time 
I will have to describe you, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six GIT quotients. And how do they vary? How do they vary as I move from, uh, from one side to the other? I will abuse uh, my time and just uh, say something. What about one? So this corresponds to linearization one over epsilon. So this is the line, uh, this is the cubic, and this is the, the line. So I give weight, weight uh, one to cubic and uh, weight uh, epsilon to line. And without saying this P of zero is actually isomorphic with M bar, so this is, uh, here is only semi-ample, but it doesn't matter. This is the GIT for cubics. So let's see. So what does it mean that I move from from zero where I have GIT for cubic. So you can think that I have a P2 bundle over the, the moduli of cubics. So what's happening if I move from, from, from zero to epsilon? And here all you need to know is the behavior, the behavior that I wrote previously in terms of behavior of semi-stable and stable things. So it turns out what's happening, and let me kind of stop here, is that if C is stable or unstable, then C comma L stays the same. And if C is semi-stable, then I can have uh, Actually, in this situation, I will only have, it becomes either stable or unstable. So remember, this means this is nodal and becomes stable if L doesn't pass through node. And unstable else passes through the node. Maybe this is some food for the fault. So as you move, if, if the cubic is smooth, you can do whatever with the line. It doesn't, it doesn't destabilize it. If the cubic is too singular, again, you can put the line transversal or whatever. But if you are in the nodal case, you have the situation the line passes through the vertex or doesn't pass it. If it passes through the vertex, it's enough to destabilize it. If it doesn't pass it through the vertex, it's enough to <laughs> move it from semi-stable to stable. And I'm already too much over time. Thank you.